Isaiah chapter 18 this evening. We're shooting for three chapters. Um, I think when Isaiah was finished with this section, before we get to chapter 36, I think he's pretty impressed with himself. I think his audience was impressed, but over two, <laughs> I don't know, what are we at? Uh, almost 3,000 years later, it's not working out so well. Anyway, um, Ethiopia, Egypt, and Iraq, that's who we're considering. Now, Assyria, uh, modern-day Iraq. So I just brought it to life with that. I, I think that these prophecies reach to all of the continent of Africa, because, of course, Ethiopia and Egypt are the northern part of Africa, but they spill out in, in, in the end-time scenario, the, the mercy and grace of God. And uh, while these two are singled out, I think the notice to humanity is, is God, he keeps the record, and he knows what he's doing, and what he does in the end is right. When ne the voice from heaven came to Nebuchadnezzar, it, sa it says, you know, you're going to be driven from men until you know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men. Now, I know this is a continuation, a little bit of last session, not so much end time stuff, which is very appealing to, to us as Christians. But all of Isaiah's words to the surviving nations, because some of the nations he preached about did not survive. The Philistines are gone. We'll get them at the end uh, sometime in, in, verse, in chapter 20. But to the surviving ones, such as Egypt and Ethiopia and Iraq, uh, there's everything he says to these countries in this section has an end time element to it. And you got to pay attention and say, okay, switching gears. But even when you don't, you say, but still, in the end, it, um, it, it just works out. So let's now look at verse 1. Woe to the land shadowed with buzzing wings, which is beyond the rivers of Ethiopia, which sends ambassadors by sea, even in vessels, verse 2, of vessels of reed on the waters, saying, go swift messengers to a nation tall and smooth of skin, to a people terrible from their beginning onward, a nation powerful and treading down whose land the rivers divide. I think Isaiah is really enjoying writing at this point. He's, he's just very colorful in his language. I, I don't think he's flowery where it's unnecessary. To us, maybe looking at it, yeah, it's a little bit much, but... In those days, I think it was very well received. He's a very intelligent man, very knowledgeable about surroundings and nature. He's a very well-educated man, and not only well-educated, he's exposed, he's, he's experienced, it comes out in his writings. Anyway, this proclamation against Ethiopia, the woe at verse 1 is more of a, hey, listen up, than trouble's on the way, although trouble is on the way for them. But not in the end, they will survive. And uh, what is going on in this section is what's been going on throughout Isaiah's ministry. Assyria, that, that the world power in that region right now, they're the threat. They're the nemesis of the region. Well, somebody's got to be. Because if somebody's not, then somebody else will be. Uh, it's just you hope that the one that is calling the shots is not uh, vicious. Well, Assyria was. And uh, Ethiopia called Cush. Some Bibles translated Cush. Um, that's, it's Ethiopia. The Septuagint, when the Jews living in Egypt decided, hey, we need a Bible, in the, our Hebrew Bible in the Greek language, they chose to interpret Cush as Ethiopia. Nothing is lost in, in that. The original Cush, you know, it's like, well, you got to go look it up in a reference book if you're not familiar with it. But Ethiopia, we know that. Anyway, Ethiopia was the southernmost part of Isaiah's world concerning Africa. And in those days, Sudan was part of Egypt. The Ethiopian, you know, put, they put a ruler on the throne in Egypt. And so they were sort of incorporated together for, for a while there also in, uh, in Isaiah's day. Uh, one king called Piyankai was an Ethiopian who ruled 
in Egypt. And so all of this to us is we have to research this. Isaiah didn't have to research it. He, he lived it. And um, so uh, as you go through your, your Old Testament, you say, man, this is really hard. My devotions, why is it so hard? Well, understand, because there are real events, real people in their day that have survived, and there are lessons within the difficult stories. And so what is happen happening here is Assyria is going to conquer Egypt. They've got their eyes on Egypt and everybody, uh, and, and Ethiopia, and that whole region is, is in panic because they've already seen what this Egyptian, uh, this Assyrian killing machine can do, their armies. And so they're sending messengers to all the people that live on the Nile and all the tributaries going to the Nile. The tall people uh, spoken of here, uh, you know, the Dinka tribes that exist today are known to be tall. I think the smooth skin is a reference to they weren't hairy and compared, you know, the Jews, all, all the men had beards and, you know, uh, so you look at, even today, you look at some people from that region and, and they're, by contrast, not. Their skins are smooth in contrast in that sense. And I think that's what he's talking about. Either way, they would have known who he was referring to. Uh, so there was a group in Jerusalem that said, this alliance would be good for us. If we can get the armies of Egypt and Ethiopia and all these little tribes on our side. Uh, we can fight the Assyrians. Well, God didn't like that plan. And that's what the prophecies are about. The prophets coming along and saying, God doesn't like this. He's going to deal with Egypt. He's going to deal with Ethiopia. He's going to deal with everybody. And, and he wants his people trusting him, not Egypt, which they kept doing. And it never benefited them. And so when he says a land shadowed with buzzing wings here in verse 2, not only because of the insect infestation <laughs> in Africa, but also uh, sort of this portraying this frantic diplomatic activity to garner support from these other peoples. If you know the story of Lawrence of Arabia, how he, part of his effort to fight the Turks that were in Israel and that uh, region of the world during the war, the First World War, he, his mission was to get the tribes to unite to fight this common enemy. Well, that's what's happening here. The, the Ethiopians are saying, we, we're going to send messengers out. We're going to get the support, and we're going to fight the Assyrians. Well, that's fine for the world, but that's not fine for Egypt, uh, for Israel. And yet, that prophet from Israel, he sees it all. Sort of like you and me when we say, yeah, Antichrist is going to be in power. The society is going to do this. This nation is going to line up with that nation. That part of the world, listen, instead of talking nations, we don't have to talk nations. We can say regions. We can say a region from, you know, modern-day Russia and Saudi Arabia. All these countries are going to get together against Israel. And the world, of course, looks at us like we're, we're crazy or, you know, some racist or something. Uh, well, that's what Isaiah is doing. He's saying, eh, that's not going to happen like that. This is what's going to happen. Verse 3 all the inhabitants of the world and dwellers of the earth, when he lifts up a banner on the mountains, you see it. And when he blows a trumpet, you hear it. And so here Isaiah is saying, God's making his message known. You're not going to miss this, verse, unless you want to, verse 4. For so Yahweh said to me, and here's the messenger, not the messenger of the Ethiopians in, in verses 1 and 2, but God's messenger. I will take my rest and I will look from my dwelling place like a clear like clear heat in sunshine, like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. And so there he's being a little, you know, creative writing. And, you know, his, his childhood mentors would be proud of him. Well said. The harvesting really got me. I got hungry when I thought about that. Anyway, verse 8, for before the harvest, when the bud is perfect and the sour grape is ripening in the flower, he will both cut off the sprigs with pruning hooks and take away and cut down the branches. A little different from, say, um, love never fails. <laughs> love suffers. You know, you read the New Testament, you understand what you're reading. You come here and you go, huh? Sprigs, pruning hooks, what's he talking about? Uh, so here's that frantic activity of men uh, to, to settle business in their own strength, in contrast to the calmness of God saying, I'm going to take my time, and when I'm good and ready, I'm going to prune. 
in God's timing, and it will be God's pruning. And Assyria here is pictured as this ripening vine that's not going to survive because God's going to judge them. And so when I come out and I say we're going to talk about Ethiopia, Egypt, and Iraq, it's because Assyria is gone. There is no Assyrian empire anymore. That area has been taken over by the people, the descendants, and other peoples known, known to us today as Iraqis. And they're made up of different people because Saddam Hussein went out of his way to torture them. You weren't part of his tribe in Iraq. When you were subject to harm uh, on, a, on, on a horrific level. Well, uh, yeah, so when you, if you see videos of Saddam Hussein coming out of a hole and you feel sorry for him, understand that man was a monster. Uh, it, you know, the Russians said, yeah, he's a monster, but he, he stabilizes the region. Uh, yeah, well, that's because you really don't respect life. You think everybody ex still exists for the state. Uh, the Soviet Union is gone in name only. Uh, well, they, they picked up some other liberties, but it still ends up supporting. All right, I'll just get back to this. So uh, where on earth are we? Verse 6. They will be left together for the mountain birds of prey and for the beast of the earth. The birds of prey will summer on them, and all the beasts of the earth will winter on them. Well, that's pretty, gr this is grotesque. He's describing the feast of scavengers on the dead bodies from the conflict. Uh, well, when we get to chapter 37, we're going to read about 185,000 Assyrian troops killed in one night, and they never came into Israel, Judah again. Uh, we get this in the tribulation pictures, the scale of bloodshed that will take place in the great tribulation in Revelation 14 and again in Revelation 19, when the, I think the blood coming up to the bridle of the horses is figurative language. Some of them, no, no, it's real. Well, you know, you're entitled to think that way. But remember, the, Jesus says right out the beginning, he's speaking in symbols and signs uh, that make the point that's why he does it. He's not trying to hide the truth so much as he's trying to tell you these symbols are long-lasting, and if you look at them, you get the picture. Uh, when I mention a dragon, you know that can't be good. Hey, if you're walking to your car and a real dragon shows up, that's not good. And so those kind of things are just all over the, the, the prophecies of the Bible. This, this imagery, it is a superior way of communicating to all the generations. And, you know, folks that complain, well, mine says them and not they. <laughs> you don't understand how the language moves and the task of translators. Anyway, verse 7, in that time, a present will be brought to Yahweh of hosts from a people tall and smooth of skin and from a people terrible from their beginnings onward, a nation powerful and treading down, whose land the rivers divide, and to the place of the name of Yahweh of hosts to Mount Zion. Well, this is messianic. This is kingdom age stuff. You see what I meant when the prophets, they move in and out, and you got to keep up with them? At what point are these people around the Nile going to come to Jerusalem and start worshiping? Well, you do have some of that today with those who say they're descendants of Haile Selassie and coming into Jerusalem. But this is much broader than that. This, this is, they're coming to Jerusalem to worship Jesus Christ, the Lord, and bringing gifts to him. Isaiah picks this up again in chapter 60 about the Gentiles, the nations coming. Uh, all the prophets were on this. Zechariah talks about it in, in detail. You know, you pay tribute to the ruling king. You don't pay to the king you defeated. Uh, and there, he's, the language he speaks in verse 7 is the language of his day of a people that are coming to a king in total submission. They weren't doing this in this time. They were calling to Judah for help to help their alliance. Well, Isaiah, Isaiah breaks off and he says, well, let me tell you what's going to happen in the end. You people that I've been, you, and you know who you are, even if we don't know, these little tribes and people, you, you're going to worship Yahweh in Jerusalem. And though, of course, we know Messiah moves, Jesus, he moves from the son, let me put it this way, the son of God 
moves from Messiah to the Christ. He becomes not only the Jewish savior, but the savior of the world. As John says, uh, says right out in, in his, his letter, he is the savior of the world. Now, whether the world receives that salvation or not, we know is, is up to them, and, and most won't. And I'll, I'll quote that verse later, but let's move forward. Verse, now we're in chapter 19 of Isaiah, and this proclamation moves from Ethiopia to Egypt. He'll come back to Ethiopia a little bit, too. And he'll stay with Egypt to the end. Uh, this 19th chapter of Isaiah contains the most important prophetic utterances concerning Egypt in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And if you were an Egyptian, I remember years ago I worked with an Egyptian, and I would think, I never got a chance to talk about it with him, but I would think, well, you know, he's in the Bible. His people are in the Bible, but I just never got a chance. Well, even now, I, 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 I don't know his name, but <clears throat> I can see his face. I'll wave to him if he gets to heaven. Anyway, uh, this is a remarkable prophecy because Isaiah is going to declare that these peoples, especially the Iraqis, Assyria, and Egypt, they're going to be worshiping Christ in all their glory in the end times. In his day... There's no chance. Assyria's, the Iraqis are coming to conquer Egypt. That's what they're going to do. But Isaiah looks beyond current events. And he speaks again to the end time. Uh, what's going to happen in that region of the world. We lose sight of just how many people live in this, just this part of the world. Maybe if you, I have a, I have a YouTube passport. I go anywhere in the world from my living room, and I go to these places. I, you know, I go. I want to see a ferry crossing some unknown, you know, river, and you see how many people are there. These are souls. God knows all of them. He knows all their thoughts before they do. Uh, it's like He's electronically plugged into everybody, and uh, it, it, so it is remarkable that He declares these enemies are going to be worshiping Isaiah's God. And Isaiah does not yet understand fully the meaning of Jesus Christ. He understands more than most, especially that 53rd chapter. And so they'll all be united, uh, worshiping the Lord and sharing his blessings. In this section, he, brings up, he uses this phrase six times, in that day. He's talking about end times. Uh, so we come to that now to verse 1. The burden against Egypt. Behold, Yahweh rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt. The idols of Egypt will totter at his presence and the heart of Egypt will melt in its midst. Well, as I mentioned, there were those in Judah that wanted Egypt and her, what she had to offer as far as protection. Uh, God's through the prophet said, not going to happen. And he brings the protection through the angel of the Lord. And that one night, uh, in we're, we're about 715 years before the coming of Christ. So in another 45 years or so, the Assyrians will conquer Egypt. And Isaiah will probably, probably be dead at that time. But these prophets, you know, they spoke with such assurance. They spoke, this is going to happen. I'm going to go die now, but this is going to happen. They all did this. I mean, Elijah says, you know what? If you ask a hard thing, you're a double portion. Greedy. <laughs> it wasn't. And he said, well, if you see me go up, how does he know that? that it's a remarkable. So the message to us is when God wants you to know what's going on, he had no problem telling you. What happens is we begin to insert our voice into God. We become a ventriloquist. I say I'm going to bless you. No weapon formed will prosper. Well, tell that to the martyrs. Physically, they did prosper. Spiritually, they did not. They didn't take their faith. So, you know, the sobriety that the Bible brings to us in these lessons that are bound from the pages, but they're hard to get. Well, uh, what good thing comes, you know, if you get something good, aren't you suspicious? If somebody walks up to you and says, hey, I'm just going to wash your car because I, I, I know I never met you, but I just want to wash your car. You'd be suspicious. You're not touching my car. I don't know about you. I, 
I'm, where I'm from, if you're walking down the street and a stranger says hi, you're on guard. Why is he being friendly? He's trying to, he's, I'm serious, this is a good way to be. Anyway, not, it's not paranoia. It's just street savvy in that context. But then you go to other places and people say hi, and you say, what are you looking at me for? And they're like, what? what's wrong with you? Anyway, when in Rome, do as the Romans. Uh, I've not been to Rome. And if I get there, I don't know if I'm going to do like they do. I just needed that little break mentally. Okay, coming back to this, this Assyrian conquest, as I mentioned, proved a failure. And their mediums, their wizards, they were unable, unable to give them the counsel. Egypt was known for her wise men. In fact, at one point, Solomon is, is said to have been wiser than the wise men of, of Egypt. And, and God is saying, well, they're wise with each other, but they're not. Well, you think when you get to heaven, God is going to say to any, refer to anyone as doctor? <laughs> Dr. Gaston, how are you? It won't even be hi, pastor. It will be, hey, I've given you a new name, and you'll be so happy with that name. I can't wait. I've got a list that I've submitted. <laughs> Tiger. I'm like, yeah. What's your name, Tiger? And, of course, anyway. These mediums, these wizards, um, and all in between, which would be the mediums. <laughs> I mean, anyone here wear medium? Do you ever think about that when you go buy it? Hmm. I don't want to be a medium. <laughs> God deals with mediums. <laughs> okay. That's hysterical if you know it. All right. Someone said, be serious, we're talking about Isaiah here. You haven't read him as many times as I've read him today. <laughs> anyway, this image of Yahweh riding on the clouds, we sing songs like that, you know, you know, riding on the clouds at the trumpet's call. Well, some of this may be ridicule to the pagan gods like Baal. There are ancient writings that uh, talk about their gods on the clouds. But Moses, way back when, did this. Deuteronomy 33, there is no one like the God of Jeshurun, that's a term of, af of, of affection, who rides the heavens to help you and in his excellency on the clouds. Well, that, so he, that's the term of affection, Jeshurun. Later on, he says, Jeshurun has grown fat. And he's all messed up now because he's just, he's just filled with things that have taken him away from me. Bloated would be the idea. Uh, anyway, so that's interesting. You know, you've got to just pay attention to these, these things. But in the New Testament, we read, Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. I wonder if he's going to take information that's in the, you know, the cyber clouds and just put in there, every knee shall bow. <laughs> you go to look up your account and it says, every knee shall bow. I don't think he's going to do that. But if he consulted me and ser is serious, he would. But he's not. <laughs> the idols of Egypt will totter at his presence. And that's, again, he's, he's masterful at playing on words. We wouldn't get through Isaiah if we stopped it every time he plays on words. But here he's talking about an idol that is man-made and set up and totters over. And so he uses that. The idols of Egypt will totter at his presence. And all the gods of Egypt were defeated by Yahweh in Moses' day. Well, they're going to be defeated again. Idolatry is making up God, making up things about God. It would be the same. What if map makers just made it up? What if they just said, no, we're going to put the ocean, we're going to put the Pacific Ocean in Nebraska on the map? I mean, it just it would be crazy. What if air traffic controllers say, yeah, you're sure you're clear, when they had no clue? Well, this is what people are doing with God. It's that same rationale or irrationale. By that illogic, gods are formed. We'll just make it up. Bow rides on clouds. Uh, what's he look like? Well, I'll show you. Well, did you ever see him? <laughs> no. But 50 bucks for <laughs> this image of him is what Demetrius was doing in Ephesus. And people are still doing it. Otherwise, highly intelligent people just making up stuff about God. Anyway, uh, Christianity, of course, believes that all the religions, all the other religions of the world that deny the lordship of Christ are idolatrous in that they are man-made. And we don't ask the world 
to tell us the meaning of spiritual things. We don't go up to the world, can you tell us what idolatry means? Because we're really struggling with this. We don't do that, we tell them. Uh, you know, you do preach the Lord's death until he returns. That is a de declaration that he's coming back because he's alive. And the communion table is, big, is a big deal. Well, uh, only scripture writes our definitions, our spiritual definitions. And whenever Christianity steps away from that, you're going to get heresy, and it happens too often. Verse 2, I will set Egyptians against Egyptians. Everyone will fight against his brother and everyone against his neighbor. City against city, kingdom against kingdom. I don't know how this has really happened in, in ancient history. I do believe it will happen in the end times is what I meant by he weaves in and out of things. Uh, Egypt's had her uprisings, but not that full-out civil wars. Uh, I don't, you know, maybe I'm missing one of one on this scale, city against city, kingdom against kingdom. Uh, I think when, when Antichrist is going to hate Islam and everything else, and he's going to deal with the Muslim Brotherhood, and you know, you got to guard that you're not rooting for him because you share a sentiment against uh, you know, false falsities and hostilities against the faith, and just saying how, how it is going to be. Uh, many of these Egyptians are going to turn from Islam, and they're going to turn to Christ, and they're going to probably do it during this time. Uh, civil war, when the Assyrians came, they were too busy with dealing with the Assyrians to fight each other. Verse 3, the spirit of Egypt will fail in its midst. I will destroy the council, and they will consult the idols and the charmers, the mediums, and the sorcerers. Uh, so they're going to look for their religion to save them, what they believe. It's not going to work. And Yahweh's going to demonstrate that those are false gods. How many people have gone to their graves clinging to their gods that are false? Well, the Lord sorts that out. Verse 4, and the Egyptians, <clears throat> let me pause here. When someone says to you as a believer, you mean to tell me God's going to send people to hell who never heard of it? And you go on that boring come back. You can say, it's, it's fair to say that I am entrusted to preach the revelation of Jesus Christ. Everything else belongs to him. Once you hear the gospel, you're now accountable to it. Jesus preached that. He said, you know, if you didn't hear, you wouldn't be held accountable to what I'm saying to you. There are other laws of accountability that God has put in place. And so they try to weasel out by suggesting that the Christian God is unjust. Well, that's not fair. Well, God is, no going, God is God of justice. He will be fair. And now that you've heard the gospel, the fair thing to do is you receive him or you receive the judgment. Now, that's fair. Well, there, there we go. Uh, it, they, I, I, you know, all the arguments I hear against Christ, to me, every one of them are, are lame and now boring. I've heard them just repeat. Uh, so, anyhow, and some people can be bully-like in there. You know, they get loud and they, they start throwing, spewing out all these supposed facts, like you're supposed to have the Britannica encyclopedia set right there at your hands to <laughs> check everything. You don't have to do that. You can just say, you're messed up inside and out, and you know it. You know, and you try to hide it, you hide behind something you do or don't, or some position you have, or some lust that you have made your God. And at death, these things are going to, they're going to drop dead with you. Anyway, verse 2, I will set the Egyptians, we did, we read that. Yeah, verse 3, <laughs> please don't read that again. The spirit of Egypt will fail in the midst, I read that too. Four, thank you very much. Can I get a five? Five, I got a five. <laughs> and the Egyptians I will give into the hand of a cruel master, and a fierce king will rule over them, says the Lord Yahweh of hosts. Well, the Assyrian Empire, again, they're going to be cruel. They're going to rule. Also, the Ethiopian rulers that came in, uh, they, were, they were cruel. But I think that um, 
and this might be a stretch, but I feel comfortable with this stretch. I don't think it's, I think it's an educated stretch. I think Islam is their cruel master. Uh, there's, there's nothing, uh, compared to true Christianity, there is nothing uh, compassionate about Islam. It's just a, they, they boast of their violence. And those who say it's a peaceful religion really are drunk with ignorance and don't know, know and know nothing of history before or now. Uh, sure, peaceful, long as you're doing it their way. Anyhow, uh, you say, are, am, am I an Islamophobe? Yeah, I'm a homophobe too. I'm a lot of phobes. I'm a crookophobe. I'm afraid of crooks. I figure if, you know, there's a lot of phobias I have that are justifiable. That doesn't mean I want to hurt them unless they're trying to hurt me, maybe. I mean, under circum circum certain circumstances, I turn the other cheek. But under other circumstances, um, you know, you, you, have to, you have to protect yourself. Anyway, uh, <laughs> verse 5. The waters will, f you can get in the flesh really quick talking about things like this. <laughs> I saw the M19, is the, 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 the MK19, it's a machine gun that shoots hand grenades. That's on my Christmas list. <laughs> As a pastor, you say you're not supposed to have that. Well, I didn't say I'm going to shoot my neighbors with it. But who, what guy wouldn't want that? It shoots out hand grenades like machine guns. I don't know. I passed out after like five minutes of seeing this thing. Came to <laughs> talking about. I'll have one. I'll have one. All right. <laughs> well, I mean, you, we all have something we want. I want an aircraft carrier. I would like to have one. All right. The waters will fail from the sea, and the river will be washed. Verse five and dried up. Now, from five through eight. Oh, even nine, he's talking about the failure of the, of the river Nile. Uh, that defines Egypt. Without the Nile, it's catastrophic. The, that Nile Delta region, Rome, why Rome took Egypt, they wanted the, the wheat and, that they could get from, from the fields of, of Egypt, and they sent it off to, to Rome and their other uh, the parts of their empire. So what he is saying here, the farming is going to fail, the fishing is going to fail, and the textiles are going to fail. Your flax, you won't, you know, all these, um, their economy, their societies, going to go through a, a catastrophic period. Uh, so the breadbasket of the delta will, will go through this. Uh, again, I, likely at, in the great tribulation period when these things really come into play. Because, again, whenever you think about the survivors of the Great Tribulation, remember what Jesus said, such as the world has never known. Is that the global catastrophes will, will just be uh, all off the chart. Verse 11, surely the princes of Zoan are fools. Pharaoh's wise counselors give foolish counsel. How do you say to Pharaoh, I am the son of the wise, the son of ancient kings, where are they? Verse 12. Where are your wise men? Let them tell you now and let them know that Yahweh of hosts has purposed against Egypt. So again, that element in Jerusalem that's looking to these wise men and is so impressed with Egypt. The prophet comes along and he's the naysayer in the party. He's, you know, the party pooper. He comes in and says, well, those guys aren't going to help you. It's going to be a failure. Verse 13. The princes of Zoan have become fools. The princes of Noph are deceived. They have also deluded Egypt, those who are the mainstay of its tribes. And, and again, here's a prophet that spoke so well about Yahweh and morality, that first chapter of Isaiah. What could they say against him that made any sense? They, there's nothing you could say, well, yeah, well, Isaiah, you know, his fingernails grow too long, you know. But there's, there's nothing really they could say against him. Um, Verse 14, Yahweh has mingled a perverse spirit in their heart, in their midst, and they have caused Egypt to err in all her work as a drunken man staggers in his vomit. Verse 15, neither will there be any work for Egypt, which the head 
or the tail, palm branch, or bulrush may do. Well, when he says the Lord has mingled a perverse spirit in her midst, scripture language, is that's it. God frequently is said to have caused that which he permits. If he permits, you find you want to be a, you know, you want to be stubborn like a mule, I'm going to let you be that. And then when the consequences call out, he, he calls them in advance. Oh, God did that. No, he did not do it. He let it happen. And he controlled it. If anything, if you say, well, he did. Let, uh, you know, he turned them over to their own passions and lusts. Yeah, he, he controls. But the initiation is with the individual, not with God. God did not say to Judas, you know, I see you, cute little boy, you know, in the family, but I'm going to make you a betrayer of the Son of God. And that do that. The Lord gave Judas every chance. He put him on his staff. He gave him every chance in front of everybody. And look what Judas did with it. And the Lord knew he was going to do with it, but he didn't make Judas do it. But he controlled it. Uh, he controlled all of it. Uh, and Judas was baptizing people and doing miracles. So... When you see, uh, you know, the news, you know, they, they salivate over when a pastor gets in trouble. Soul news happens, grow up. Uh, not that it's good, uh, not at all condoning it, but uh, it's, it's just be sensible. Well, Isaiah, he knows how to paint a word picture very successfully. And he says it will get ugly. You're going to be like a bunch of drunk men and he, you know, that language, you know, slipping and sliding in your own vomit. I mean, that's just bad stuff, Isaiah. What are you thinking about? He says, well, I'm creative today. <laughs> and God did. He destroyed everything that the Egyptians trusted. When he talks about the head, the tail, the palm, he used this language in chapter 9, and he's saying your political unity, your, your, the economy, your religion, your wisdom, it's all going to fall apart when the Assyrians show up. Verse 16, in that day, Egypt will be like a woman and will be afraid and fear because of the waving of the hand of Yahweh of hosts, which he waves over it. Now, of course, you, you picture an ancient city, and all the men are out to war, and yet another group of men come into that town, and there's no defense. Of course, they're going to be uh, vulnerable and, and panic-stricken. But for Isaiah to word it this way to present Egypt, they would have been quite insulted at that comparison. Well, he's not pulling punches. Um, again, in that day, verse 16 is, is the first of six of them. He uses 44 of them in his writings, more than anybody else in the Bible, because he sees into the future. Uh, well, I, that's not worded right. He doesn't see into the future. God shows him the future. We have to make sure that we understand anything this prophet saw was because God gave it to him. And he didn't put, you know, line up chicken bones in a certain direction on a certain day and then guess about you know, if a person was a large or a medium. <laughs> All right. Um, you say, stop making fun of other religions. No, they do it to me. <laughs> Very childish response. <laughs> uh, look, sad, you know, if it's true and it's not meant maliciously, you have a cho choice. If you're on that bad team, if you're a Mormon, change teams. Confess to the Lord Jesus and realize that um, the guy with the glasses who saw into the bit. All right. Joseph Smith, you know, he, hey, I got these good glasses. And he puts them on. And it's reruns of Abbott and Costello in 3D. <laughs> a, a lot of archaeologists have searched for the things he's said and not even close. In the Bible, they're running out of space to put the things they find in the scripture. They, you know, mocking, well, there's no record of any Pontius Pilate. Then he finds a stone, Pontius Pilate, governor. <laughs> and he's like, oh, okay, well, all right, how about this guy? Who? Edgar McGillicuddy. Well, he's not in the Bible. Yeah, but you haven't found his name anywhere. Anyway, verse 19. And the, <laughs> and the land of Judah will be a terror to Egypt. Everyone who makes mention of it will be afraid of himself because of the counsel of Yahweh of hosts, which he has determined against it. Now, this has already happened. Mark Gabriel's book, Islam and the Jews, we, ha we have it in the chapel store. Um, I, I like it. I, I like, you know, you don't, have many, you don't need to read 20 books on this topic. He does an excellent job, and he opens up with, when he was a child in Egypt, how much fear and hatred they had of Israel and how much 
the fear of they were going to be attacked any day. And it was never the case. Um, when Israel attacked Egypt, it was in response and retaliation. It was never initiated by Israel. And my point is, the prophet is saying, the land of Judah will be a terror to Egypt. Well, that has been fulfilled, and probably other times in history too, but this is one that's very recent. Uh, so if you, if you want to look for, um, there, are, there are quite a few books out there on, on Islam and the, the mentality of it that um, I, they don't get enough airtime. Philistine is another one. I don't know if we still have that one. And uh, it gives you just a, a, a solid education on what you're dealing with without having to read volumes over and over. Anyway, uh, uh, the vast numbers of Muslims will come to Christianity, will be saved in the great tribulation period. Verse 18, in that day, five cities in the land of Egypt will speak the language of Canaan and swear by Yahweh of hosts, one will be called one will be called the city of destruction. And so this is, you know, this is end times. He's saying the time's going to come where there are going to be converts in Egypt, in, in these five cities that he's singling out. One of them he calls the city of destruction. Now he's probably taking a jab at the city of the sun, which was, you know, they worshiped the sun, the Egyptians. It was one of their main gods. And he's coming along and saying, well, I'm going to change. And they were notorious. These Jewish, these Jewish historians were notorious. Jezebel, it's probably not her real name. They changed it to, to be, more, you know, an insult. Uh, Antiochus of Epith, they just did it with a lot of them. Anyhow, coming back to this, uh, fear turns them to repentance and repentance to deliverance because it, 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 this, this submission to God brings his compassion and he is poetically saying, you're going to speak the language of Canaan. Well, what's the language of Canaan? It's the Jewish language. It's the Hebrew language. He's being, again, poetic. He's mixing up his writing so he's not boring his audience with, um, you know, repetitive language. And, and that's why writers, writers do it. Um, uh, some of you know about Shelby Fort. He is he's dead now. If you have ever watched Ken Burns' series on the Civil War, which I recommend everybody watch, uh, he's, he's I, don't, I wouldn't even have to tell you, single him out, but he's the one guy getting interviewed that you just want more of. And he was a writer, uh, just a voracious reader. I have forgotten entirely why I brought him up. Uh, Oh, the language. And so he talks about, you know, his writing and developing his writing and what he does, what he did. He lived to be like, I don't know, 90 almost. Uh, anyway, he's a Mississippi boy. You wouldn't, I wouldn't say that if I was preaching to you in Brooklyn. I wouldn't say he's a Mississippi. I would say he's a guy from Mississippi. Okay, let's finish this. Uh, so the five cities will speak the language of Canaan. Uh, which is uh, just going to happen in the end times, where it says they will swear uh, uh, the, the language of Canaan and swear by the Lord of hosts. They will give their allegiance to make their confession of faith, a city of destruction I've commented on. Jeremiah comments on these things in the 43rd chapter um, when he says, I will kindle a fire in the houses of the gods of Egypt, and he shall burn them and carry them away captive. Well, that's what happened the Assyrians and other peoples, the Greeks, Chaldeans, other armies have come and, and taken away uh, their gods. So uh, verse 19, in that day there will be an altar to Yahweh in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar to Yahweh and its border. And so there will be monuments. This will, this will not be an active altar where blood sacrifices will be taking place. Christ is, of course, fulfilled these things, but there will be monuments to Christ. We have them now. When, when you wear a cross around your neck, it's a monument to what Christ has done, uh, the cross of Christ. I, I do think the tomb should get more. I think there should be a lot more jewelry that uh, has the open tomb. I, I don't know why. That has not over the centuries registered more with Christians. Uh, but uh, coming back to verse 20, and it will be for a sign and for a witness to Yahweh of hosts in the land of Egypt. For they will cry to Yahweh because of the oppressors, and he will send them a savior, 
a mighty one, and he will deliver them. We're not talking about a man, a human being. You're talking about this, Jesus Christ. Now, here's a side. You, you say, well, that would be crazy to tell an Egyptian, a Muslim Egyptian today. Well, it was crazy to tell a sun-worshipping Egyptian in Isaiah's day to say, you people are going to forsake these mediums and sun gods and all this other stuff, and you're going to worship our God, a Jewish God. That would have been insane. But he's calling it like it is, and we now know it's going to happen. Uh, incidentally, speaking about these um, non-functioning altars, well, that's what Jacob offered when surely God is in this place that I knew or not, and he took a stone and he anointed it with oil. It was not a place of blood sacrifice. It was, I'm going to remember this. Uh, that was, was his approach. Uh, when Joshua comes along, he puts monuments all over. They almost go to war over a monument with his own people. Anyway, verse 21, then Yahweh will be known to Egypt, and the Egyptians will know Yahweh in that day, in that, and there is another one, and make sacrifice and offerings. Yes, they will make a vow to Yahweh and perform it. So they're going to be devout believers, and when he talks about they will make a sacrifice, that's the language. What else was he supposed to say in that day? He couldn't say to them, Messiah is going to come, and there will be no more sacrifices. That will be it. And how would he even begin to, to articulate that? We have to get the Old Testament together and look at the history of the Gospels, and we get it. But imagine not having the Gospels. How could you communicate these things? And so that's why some of the language in the Old Testament is uh, limited to their understanding of worship at the tabernacle of, of Moses, which was Solomon's eventually temple. Verse 22, and Yahweh will strike Egypt. He will strike and heal it. They will turn to Yahweh, and he will be entreated by them and heal them. So whatever scourge of falsity Egypt is under, that will go away. Mercy, again, thrives in that environment of repentance, and it will be found in the heart of the Egyptian people. As I said at the beginning, I do not think this is limited to Egypt. I think what we see, the, the prophecies to Egypt, will spill over to other peoples. And we know that. Well, I, I would go that way because we're going to see him. We've already applied it to Ethiopia, and he's going to do it to the Assyrians. Uh, verse 23, in that day, there will be a highway from Egypt to Assyria, and Assyria will come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians will serve with the Assyrians. And so there you have the Egyptians and the Iraqis you know, just worshiping together. When he talks about the mighty Savior, uh, the Son of God, Savior of the world, 1 John chapter 4, verse 14, and we have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. John got a little irritated with his uh, Gnostic audience saying Christ is a phantom. He says, listen, we've seen him. We've touched him. I used to lie my head on his bosom. How many times did you read that in his gospel? The one who lied. <laughs> He's telling you he was real. He wasn't uh, some mystical being. Uh, the incarnation was every bit God as in, in human form. So uh, here he, he talks about the Assyrians and, and the Egyptians who are presently enemies. You remember we started off saying the Assyrians are coming. The Ethiopians are panicking. They're reaching out to Egypt. They're reaching out to the people on, you know, up the Nile, the tribes. And they're reaching out to, to Judah and <coughs> forming this confederacy. And then Isaiah comes back and says, listen, the day's going to come when you're not going to be trying to fight the Assyrians. You're going to be worshiping with them. There's going to be a highway coming from Assyria right into Egypt. And you're going to go back and forth with worship. Who would not want that? Verse 24, in that day Israel will be one of three with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the land. Verse 25, whom Yahweh of hosts shall bless, saying, blessed is Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. And so there, these three are, are put together, seen worshiping. Israel is destined to be a blessing to the world. Here it is right now. Zechariah 12. Behold, I will make Israel a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and Jerusalem. And it shall happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all peoples. All, all who would heave it away will surely be cut to pieces, though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. 
And so there, Isaiah is saying, the world's going to be want to be rid of Israel, but they're going to be drunk over her, and just leave this little piece of land alone. It's not even as big as Jersey, and just want well, just leave it. No, they can't because Satan's driving them. The hatred Satan has for the promises of God and the people of God. Well, he says the world just wants to throw them away, but they can't get rid of it. Uh, and and is the nations of the earth will be gathered against it. Ergo Armageddon, that final battle. And Isaiah 2 is, tells us the end. Well, what happens? Well, well, everything we've been talking about, this road, this highway back and forth, they're worshiping together, they shall beat their... Well, and he shall judge between the nations and rebuke many people. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So it all comes together. If these three... Israel, Egypt, and Iraq can be united, then so can the world in the kingdom age, and not before. Well, Deuteronomy 32, 29. Oh, that they were wise, that they understood this, that they would consider their latter end. Well, that's our whole message. Okay, chapter 20 is very quick, six verses. I can stretch it out to 40. <laughs> in the year that Tartan came to Ashdod, <clears throat> when Sargon, the king of Syria, sent him, and he fought against Ashdod and took it. This was the only ancient men known mention of Sargon, this king of Assyria, until archaeologists later found some more stuff. Ooh, thank you for that. Anyway, uh, uh, you should understand, archaeologists get it wrong a lot, and mainly because of their biases. They got Jericho so wrong. I don't remember there was a, a female archaeologist so touted in that community, not because she was a female, but just, and she was told so wrong about Jericho. It's embarrassing. Anyway, uh, here we have the Egyptian, Assyrian, Philistine, and Ethiopian all summed up. The tartan there was a type of necktie that had a plaid. <laughs> no, it didn't. <laughs> it's, a, it's a commander of the Assyrian army under their, their king Sennacherib. We'll get to that in chapter 37. So Isaiah is, um, he, he mentioned Sargon, that was, was their king. This is sort of a footnote to the prophecies already spoken of these two. Verse, two. verse two now, at the same time, Yahweh spoke by Isaiah, the son of Amoz, saying, go and remove the sackcloth from your body and take your sandals off your feet and he did so walking naked and barefoot. Okay, this, that, why? So he's making the prophet a walking prophecy. Every time you see him, there he is. Doesn't have any shoes on? No service for you. Uh, it's just, uh, is he truly naked? Did he, or is he stripped down? Well, most of the good commentators say he was, he was naked. I, I don't, I don't agree with that. And, and they could be right, but so could I. And the reason why, you know, there's little kids around. I mean, that's the reason enough. Leviticus 18 goes into length about uncovering the nudity of others. Now, granted, though, this is mainly in a sexual way that that's presented. But the idea of nudity still is addressed in that. And, I, I mean, today, if a pastor did this... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, I think he was, he was to dress as a prisoner of war that, that is the goal and he is saying that uh, Egypt will be conquered and taken away as prisoners of war stop trusting them and to drive this home to the Judean element in Jerusalem that kept trying to get the government to go with Egypt this, these were his instructions. Verse 3, Then Yahweh said, Just as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot three years for a sign and a wonder against Egypt and Ethiopia. Now, that was that alliance between the two. Uh, Ezekiel does a similar thing. God tells him to go, you know, fix food with dung. And it's not human. It's, you know, so it drives on his point. It's these, what would you call it? Um, the M is... It's hyperbole. It's emphatic. It, it drives the point that you don't forget it. Uh, drives it home. Anyway, my servant, there are many Christians that love to claim they are servants of, of Jesus Christ. 
until you treat them like one. And I would I have to watch myself too. He's treating me like a servant. Oh, that's right. Uh, so anyway, he walked naked and barefoot here in verse 3. He is a POW, depicting a POW being carried into captivity. Um, he probably stripped down to a loincloth and uh, no shoes. That would be my guess. If I'm wrong, fine. We're going to get more too much information next, verse 4. So it seems like his disciples are writing this because the personal pronouns change. Anyway, so shall the king of Assyria lead away the Egyptians as prisoners and the Ethiopians as captives, young and old, naked and barefoot, with their buttocks uncovered to the shame of Egypt. Now, if I were 14 years old, I'd be giggling at that. But at my age, I'm like, I don't want to hear all that. It's too much. But his audience got the point, and, and that's why it is there. It's not a mistake. God, God knows how to, to reach them. Uh, anyway, verse, tw verse 5, Then they shall be afraid and ashamed of Ethiopia, Ethiopia their expectation, and Egypt their glory. And so he says, yeah, there you go. Now you'll stop reaching to those people um, when, you, when you see these things happening. Verse 6, and the inhabitant of this territory will say in that day, surely such is our expectation. Wherever we flee for help to be delivered from the king of Assyria, and how shall we escape? So he leaves them with that question because they know the answer. They have put a misplaced reliance on people, not God. And that's why he leaves it there because then he's going to now talk about Babylon. So let's do Isaiah 21 now. Not kidding. It's like, no, we're done. <laughs> let's pray. I mean, it's kind of a, exciting when you see it, you know, through his eyes, what he's dealing with and the people of those days. And then you see this devout Jew saying, God's not forgotten the Gentiles. He, he, he's going to do right. Let's pray. Our Father, thank you for the scripture. You have recorded these things for our edification, and may you find us putting them to work. And may you get us all home safely this evening. And these things we ask you in Jesus' name. Amen.